God, we gather in this place, our home place. We recognize you among us. The words you will speak to us and have been speaking already. Making us comfortable and yet challenging us. We ask God that you help us hear the word we are meant to hear and do the work we're meant to do. In Christ we pray. Amen. Well, as you heard, just because you are accepted by God doesn't mean you'll be accepted by your people. Just because you are called by God doesn't mean you'll be understood by your home congregation. In fact, being chosen by God may stir up some hostility among the very people you are called to serve. Those who should know better may have other plans for you. I believe I shared with some of you my first week as pastor, little town, Declining, the church declining, the older gentleman, retired CEO, approached me and said, Well, you know, you're a pastor, you're like the CEO. If you tell people to go to Sunday school, they'll go. By the way, if that works, I'm going to try that. I said, Well, my model as pastor is not CEO, but it's shepherd. So if one goes wandering away, I won't fire him. I'll go looking for him. Came to my office about a week later with his plan for me. 
came up. He said, Brother Leonard, he said, my wife is down in the truck and she's feeling pretty down today. I wonder if you could come outside and cheer her up. You know, you're like a cheerleader. I said, well, I'm not a cheerleader, but I would be glad to go out and talk with your wife. Even those who know better may have alternative plans for us. It happened to Jesus when he preached his first sermon. There in his home church, his synagogue, he stood up, read from Isaiah 61, which describes the Messiah as one who would bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, release for the captives. And he preached that one-sentence sermon This prophecy is fulfilled today in your very presence. His congregation, the neighbors, friends, family, they all looked at each other and smiled. The year of God's favor right here in Nazareth. How nice. And it made them feel good. They felt good about themselves. They felt good about Jesus. It says that. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. But then things took a different turn. Jesus couldn't leave well enough alone, I guess. Because following that statement, the synagogue became a mob. An angry, violent mob. They led him to the edge of a cliff with hopes of shoving him off that cliff for dead. From isn't this Joseph's son to let's kill him, what happened? Why the sudden violence? Well, Jesus just told them that their plans for him were not his plans. Did he understand them to doubt him? Or had he injured their pride? I think Jesus understands that there are some expectations from the hometown boy. They expect he will perform miracles and do some mighty works among them. We know this because Jesus says so. He predicts they will hear about the miracles and the extraordinary work he will be doing in Capernaum. And they will say to him, do for us, your own people, what you're doing there in Capernaum. Surely we, your home church, surely we, your home people, deserve at least that much or better. So there were expectations that the home folk would get at least the treatment that those strangers and foreigners are getting up in Compertium. We know how it goes. The closer to power, the more power we receive. The closer to power, the more influence we acquire. The more access we have to influence and power, the more likely we get what we want. Because as they say, membership has its privileges. How do we know that this is the case? How do we know that the issue here is more than just mere familiarity? We know this because of the way Jesus responds to them. He predicts that they will say, do here in your hometown what you're doing in Capernaum. They have a possessiveness that resents Jesus taking God's favor outside Nazareth. Outside his hometown. To outsiders. To make matters worse... It's Capernaum, right? Capernaum is not like Nazareth. It was a fishing village. 
a busy trading center. A been to Capernaum, it's located the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is located in a strategic area. The Via Maris Highway runs through there. It was a crossroads between Damascus in Syria and Caesarea Maritima on the Mediterranean Sea. It was between Tyre and Egypt. There was a trading center there. Many of the traders, the caravans of foreign people would stop in Capernaum to refuel, to get some dried fish, some supplies. There were customs taxes taken from those travelers. So these people, many in Capernaum, were not Jewish. They were different. Foreign may have spoken different languages. Capernaum was not religiously and nationally pure as Nazareth was. They were more worldly. It was New York City or Houston, Miami. There were people who looked, talked, worshipped, behaved, believed different than the people of Jesus' hometown. We know his congregation was moved to violence, murderous violence, because they're offended. They're offended by his association with those foreigners up in Capernaum, insulted by his taking God's favor to those strangers. We know it because of the two stories he tells. First, it says in 1 Kings 17 and 18 that many widows in Israel were suffering under a prolonged drought. And while widows in Israel were suffering, Elijah, God's prophet, Elijah, brought relief to one, a foreigner from Sidon. Then he tells another story. 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14. They would know this story. While there were many lepers in Israel suffering, Elisha, God's prophet, Elisha, healed only one, a foreigner from Syria. Jesus turns their own sacred stories back on them. They know it. He brings up examples of how God has favored the outsider. He might even remind them that they too were outsiders once and he reached out to them and brought them in. How quickly we forget. Now Jesus didn't make up these stories. They aren't parables he makes up sometimes that offends people. He's quoting their scripture, their Bible stories It's from their own Bible. They would know these stories. Why such violence then? Why such intense hostility that they would move to want to kill one of their own? Well, Fred Craddock says, anger and violence are the last defense of those who are made to face the truth embedded in their own tradition. It's their last defense. They've been made to face the truth embedded in their own tradition. You can break a mirror, but the blemishes don't go away. You can kill the messenger, but the message doesn't change. He goes on to say, those at war with themselves and what they know to be true often make casualties even of those who seek their good. Sometimes those who have our best interest in mind, if they speak the truth, are harmed. The synagogue, his home church is now a mob. They attempt to stone Jesus. Their scriptures allow this, by the way. They can stone people to death. They can throw the stones or they can push them into the stones or onto the stones for them to die. But thankfully, Jesus escapes. It would be a very short Bible 
had he not. Jesus, Jesus just escapes through the crowd. We don't know the details. But just because you are accepted by God does not mean you may be accepted by your people. And just because you're called by God doesn't mean you'll be understood by your people. And sometimes being called by God stirs up hostility among the very people you're called to serve. And some have other plans for you. Sociologist, Baptist preacher, Tony Campolo, writes that Peter Arnett, Peter Arnett was a news reporter, I think CNN at one time, was a news reporter. He always has fascinating stories to tell from his experiences. He said, one day I asked Peter, Peter, do you have any good stories? I live by stories and I'm running low. Peter said, I have a wonderful story for you. He said, I was in Israel. I was in a small town in the West Bank, Palestinian area. There was an explosion that went off nearby. Bodies were blown through the air. Everywhere I looked, there were signs of death and destruction. The screams of the wounded, he said, seemed to be coming from every direction. And then a man came running up to me, holding a bloodied little girl in his arms. He pleaded with me, Mr. I can't get to the hospital. The Israeli troops have sealed off the area. No one can get out, but you are press. You can get us out. Please, mister, help me get her to a hospital. Please, if you don't, she's going to die. He said, Peter told me how he put them in the car and got them through that sealed area, and they rushed toward the hospital in Jerusalem. The whole time he was hurtling down the road toward Jerusalem, the man was pleading from the back seat, calling out, Go faster, please, mister, go faster. I'm losing her. I'm losing her. When they finally got to the hospital, the little girl was taken back to the operating room. And the two men retreated back into the waiting area. They were so exhausted, they didn't even speak. It was just silence. After a short while, the doctor came out of the operating room and said to them, quite solemnly, she's dead. The man collapsed in tears. Peter put his arms around the man to comfort him. He said, I, I don't know what to say. I can't imagine what you are going through. I've never lost a child. The man looked at Peter, kind of startled like. And he said, oh, mister, that Palestinian girl was not my daughter. I'm an Israeli settler. That Palestinian is not my child. But mister, there comes a time when each of us must realize every child, regardless of that child's background, is a daughter or a son. There must come a time, he said, when we realize we are all family. Kim Polo says, when I heard that story, I saw all the more clearly why Jesus came into the world. He came to break down all the partitions and barriers that we construct to separate us into opposing groups. He came to make us family. Well, maybe it worked. Maybe someone got it. Jesus went to Nazareth. He went to Capernaum too. He went to the Jews and the Gentiles, both. To citizens and to aliens, to hometown folk and to strangers, to the congregation and to individuals, to the black and the white, conservative, liberal, to the rich, to the poor, 
the insider, the outsider, the saint, and the sinner. Saying there must come a time when we realize we're all family. Now do you see why they wanted to stone Jesus? His first sermon set in motion a resentment that would grow and grow until the ultimate rejection around the cross. His sermon in Nazareth foreshadowed Israel's rejection of Jesus for taking the message of God to outsiders, the Gentiles. But remember this. Jesus does not go elsewhere because he is rejected. He is rejected because he goes elsewhere. He's rejected because he goes elsewhere. Rejected for taking the gospel to the wrong people. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, fulfilled. We may break the mirror. We may stone the messenger. We may crucify the preacher. But today, the scripture is fulfilled. Amen. Pray with me, please. God, we hope we have heard what you meant to tell us. And we pray that we'll not reject your message. But that we'll receive it and share it. At least give us the awareness that you love many people different from us too and help us to tear down the walls of petitions to separate all of us groups in Christ we pray amen